I'm Peter May. I'm chairman of the board of Mount Sinai. This is an amazingly exciting day for me personally and for hopefully all of you who are in this room as we join to celebrate the opening of the Leon and Norma Hess Center for Science and Medicine. This represents a decade of planning, of dreaming, of striving, a lot of hard work, a lot of begging for money, not necessarily begging, but, but asking people to support this organization. And this building is really symbolic of the transformation that has taken place at Mount Sinai over the last 10 years. And when you look around, uh, what you see is a magnificent building. But you really only see the visible proof of Mount Sinai and how it's become one of the elite academic medical centers in the world. The Hess Center is really going to be a game changer, but not just for Mount Sinai, but for the future of healthcare and mainly with things that you cannot see. This building was built to inspire collaboration, to energize innovation, and to transform the way medicine is conceived and delivered. Its impact can't be measured just in square feet. In fact, when the building officially opened less than two months ago, it had already made a profound difference in Mount Sinai's ability to provide the best, most compassionate care in the face of adversity. Because Hurricane Sandy struck New York City on the day that the plan was to move the Daryl Ruttenberg Cancer Treatment Center from the Guggenheim Building into this building. Our the, the, the Ruttenberg Center is Mount Sinai's outpatient cancer treatment center. Our overall response, and Mount Sinai's overall response to Hurricane Sandy was one, that the in, one of the institution's finest hours. And nowhere was that more evident than here because we actually did move the, the program from the Guggenheim building into this building that day in spite of everything that was going on outside. And it gave us the ability to be able to accommodate the patients who came to us from NYU, from Bellevue, and from other hospitals. So it was an incredibly uh, brilliant way of recognizing that Mount Sinai responds to adversity in the best possible way. So I want to take this opportunity to thank everybody who's been involved. Our Board of Trustees has been stalwart in their support from the beginning, from both a strategic planning point of view and from being willing to dedicate the resources necessary to build this facility, but more important, to commit Mount Sinai to fill this facility with great people, which takes an enormous amount of talent, which you'll hear about from Dr. Charney and Dr. Davis. Uh, I want to thank all of our donors. Uh, obviously, Sinai has a history of philanthropy that is equal to very few other institutions in the world, and that philanthropy has made us able to do all the things that we do here. And I particularly want to acknowledge the leadership of President and CEO Dr. Kenneth Davis and our Dean Dennis Charney, who've guided Sinai through this extraordinary challenging time and have brought us to where we are today and will lead us forward into the future. Without them, we never would be able to be where we are. I also want to take this opportunity to be, to just um, acknowledge our new logo. Um, today is our official unveiling of the new look for Mount Sinai. Um, we discovered that we probably had hundreds of different ways of, of, of representing our institution from every different department and every different component of the medical center, and we embarked on a uh, mission and uh, an identity program a while ago that culminated in in uh, unveiling this logo, which I think really represents the future, the strength, and, and, uh, and the dedication of Mount Sinai. And it will be, hopefully, you'll start to see it more and more. We've got some of them on our new white coats. Um, I got my tag today that's got, my, got the new logo. But I think it really, and we'll, you'll see it all over the city. Um, and I think it will serve to have everybody recognize the forwardness of this organization. 
So now it's my great honor to introduce to you my partner and close friend, our leader, uh, Dr. Kenneth Davis, our CEO. Well, um, thank you all for being here today. I mean, this is, I'm going to ad lib a few lines here. It's um, really very unusual circumstance for me to be sitting here in a conference room that has my wife and my name on it. Um, it's an odd feeling. Uh, as my wife pointed out, when she was a medical student, she would sit in the back of the room and sew. And if any of the professors who taught us then would have thought that someday a conference room in an auditorium like this would be named after her, she would have said, that's just inconceivable. Not that student. But they were wrong, as were her teachers for many years. Um, I'll go on about this. When, when um, uh, Bonnie's a very unusual person, and I can talk about that because she's not here. Uh, when, when we were in, we were in high school together, in junior high school together, although we didn't date till medical school. But in, in high school, she's a very, very bright girl, um, but she never attended classes. So she, her mother was called one day and was asked, um, you know, your daughter, she's not in class now. And my mother-in-law said, so where is she? And they said, well, she's in the library reading books. And my mother-in-law said, so what do you want me to do? <laughs> and that's been Bonnie ever since. And that's part of the reason why we're able to make the gift that we were able to do to facilitate the naming of this auditorium. So now, let me move on to what I want to talk about today. It's um, an honor for me to be here with members of the Board of Trustees, with leaders from the city and the state, and with all the Mount Sinai community. It's also a pleasure for me always to share a platform with Peter May, who has been an extraordinary chairman of the board here. Um, we talk about the history of Mount Sinai. We recognize the great chairs. And, and of course, Gus Levy stands out as one of the really extraordinary people. Um, Peter's stature is equal, if not greater, in the accomplishments that he has provided in the last 10 years, the guidance and the leadership that he's provided to this medical center. I mean, you should know, in our darkest days, when Peter turned to me and he said, um, I want you to be the CEO, not just the dean, and I had this wave of nausea, like, are you, are you possibly serious? Um, I was calling him every night. And we were talking about what we were going to do in those darkest days. And if it wasn't for his leadership, we wouldn't be here today. And of course, there is no greater recruiter of faculty than I've ever met than Dennis. I mean, an extraordinary leader, an extraordinary dean. You know, I love Nate Case. He's a great person. But this man is not just the greatest dean in the history of Mount Sinai, but undoubtedly, I think, the greatest dean in academic medicine today, bar none. So. That's for sure. But, <laughs> but anyway, so to go on, this building is a dream come true. Um, it's a dream fulfilled for Mount Sinai. It's a milestone in our history of the institution. And it really is an outstanding achievement among academic medicine in the United States. Um, the Hess Center was conceived, as Peter said, some nearly 10 years ago before it had a name, um, before it was even a hole in the ground and before we had any money to put it up. Uh, and along the way, something bad happened, and that was the Great Recession. And when the Great Recession happened, all the institutions around the United States decided that they would not go forward with their building. And in fact, for Mount Sinai, the financial arrangement that we had to make this happen fell apart. The Durst Fentner organization that was going to be s building what is the residential tower behind us, and was buying the air rights from Mount Sinai, which was going to support the business model to build this, it all fell through. But our board decided to take a risk and to move forward in 2008 when there was no credit. And we, as a consequence, have the first new building in an academic medical center that's being completed in 2012. Now, there'll be more buildings that are happening in the academic medical centers, as the Wall Street Journal talked about today. But those are in late 2013. We're here earlier, and that's important, because it's facilitated an extraordinary amount of recruitment that has been made possible by this wonderful building. Now, 
We owe thanks to a lot of people for making this happen. But of course, the most prominent is the Hess family. Um, John Hess has, in the name of his parents, provided an extraordinary amount of philanthropy for this building. Now, that rests upon the relationship that his family has had with Mount Sinai since 1966, when Leon Hess first joined the board at Mount Sinai. His family has been intimately connected to Mount Sinai, and as so many families, has a multi-generational commitment to Mount Sinai. And we're very, very honored to be associated with the Hess family and look forward to their continued deep involvement with Mount Sinai in the future. In fact, I am sure that many of the people in this room will be meeting John Hess as he will quarterly chair the research committee of our board of trustees as he talks about and we talk to him about what's going on at Mount Sinai and the research we're doing. So, over the past few years, with the erection of this building and our preparation for it, we've grown a lot of the critical centers at Mount Sinai. We've grown the Tisch Cancer Institute, the Friedman Brain Institute, the Helmsley Charitable Trust Center for Cardiovascular Research, the Translational and Molecular Imaging Institute, the Mindich Child Health and Development Institute, and our primary care and diabetes practices. And those practices are now housed in the residential tower that is adjacent to this building and connected to this building, bottom 10 floors of which are housed by Mount Sinai, either infrastructure or offices. These entities, all these institutes, are at least in part or in whole located in this building today. Now, Mount Sinai Hospital, that doesn't even include the school, just the hospital, and the school is equal in size to the hospital. The hospital is the 10th largest employer in New York City. Um, I imagine that the hospital and the school together is probably the second or third largest employer in New York City. But with this building, we will add some 800 new jobs. Scientists, physicians, technicians, allied health professionals, support staff, a whole cadre of people who will be opening the doors to this building and these laboratories and being part of outstanding clinical facilities. And they together will open a new chapter in Mount Sinai's history. So as Peter alluded to, to capture and represent the energy that now exists at Mount Sinai and to move away from the colossal chaos that was our other logos, we have unveiled this new logo today. Um, so let me take you through it. As you might be wondering, why did we do this? Well, this is a mountain, the Mount Sinai Range. That was what our consultants came up with, and we looked at many logos and we thought that was a great idea. It captured, I think, the strength of Mount Sinai. But there's something else that's very subtle about this that maybe only the right side of your brain will appreciate, and it may take decades for it to sink in, but it's important, <laughs> and that is that these lines intersect to form a new color, a violet in the middle. And that reflects the intersection of physicians and scientists, physicians and patients, scientists and patients, to come up with something better than we come up individually. And that is, in fact, what this building is about. Because when it was designed, it was designed to facilitate collaboration. We can say that, but it only happens when you've got some smart architects who provide re areas that people can actually, will actually want to get together in, whether it's accidentally or with forethought. So that's the new symbol. We're very proud of it. Um, and I think it represents a watershed moment for us and an important new symbol for where we're going. So I couldn't be more proud of where we are today. I thank you all for coming. And now it's my pleasure to have my friend Dennis Charney talk to you about what's really going to go on in this building. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Peter. And thank you to all of you for being here today to celebrate this milestone in the history of Mount Sinai. This beautiful place is going to be an engine of discovery between physicians and scientists and among scientists from cancer, neuroscience, cardiology, molecular imaging, 
genomics, and others that are going to transform the future of medicine. At the risk of being too bold, I'm going to make several predictions. And in fact, if you don't shoot for the summit, you never get there. So that's what we're after. In cancer, and don't get nervous, Stephen, <laughs> where we have already built virtually overnight one of the top clinical care programs, our scientists will discover improved therapies for the most common and lethal cancers. For brain diseases, we will change the prognosis for patients with devastating diseases such as Alzheimer's disease, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, schizophrenia, depression, and others. For cardiovascular disease, we will develop gene and stem cell therapies that will reverse cardiac failure, not just treat it. For our children with chronic illnesses, will we help them lead a better life and have a brighter future? Our role in advancing molecular imaging technologies will greatly improve diagnostic accuracy and the measurement of the effects of therapy. And our investment in genomics will revolutionize human biology and lead to a truly new era of personalized and precise medicine. Now, it is natural to wonder when we will witness this transformative progress. And in response, I will paraphrase President Kennedy. Advancements of this magnitude cannot happen within one year. They may not even be accomplished within a few years. But this is our moonshot, where we're shooting for the top. And by the end of this decade, I think we will bear witness to some of the accomplishments that I just mentioned. We, the physicians and scientists of Mount Sinai, are literally going to battle against the most serious diseases that afflict mankind. And here's another analogy. I find inspiration, and maybe you will too, from the speech given by King Henry V on St. Crispin's Day, which was right before the Battle of Agincourt in 1415, when the vastly outnumbered British defeated the, the uh, French in a major battle in history. Now, before this battle, King Henry V tells his troops that after this victory, but he was talking before the battle, they will be remembered for the ages. And that those who were not there and were at the time safe in their homes will forever regret it. This is the way William Shakespeare said it. What feats were done that day? Then shall our names familiar in his mouth as household words, Henry, Harry the King, Bedford and Exeter, Warwick and Talbot, Salisbury and Gloucester, be in their flowing cups freshly remembered. And the gentlemen in England, now in bed, shall think themselves accursed that they were not here. Well, you're all, all here now. Our scientists are here. Our scientists in the past and physicians in the past like Crone, Churgen, Strauss, Sachs, Brill, Popper, and many others are all Mount Sinai physicians and scientists that have been remembered for many generations after their initial discoveries. But now, in this room, many of the scientists are in this room and leaders, and others who will be coming from around the country and around the world to do their work in this building, we have a new Mount Sinai core of discovery who count themselves fortunate for this opportunity and are ready to do battle. The work to be done by physicians and scientists in this room today will benefit future generations and will long be remembered. And by achieving their dreams, they will make the dreams of so many others, our patients and their families, come true. Truly, Mount Sinai, a special place and a special time. Thank you very much. It is now my honor to introduce four special guests who are here to celebrate the Hess Center opening and share in our dreams for the future. Senator Liz Kruger, Assemblyman Dick Gottfried, Assemblymember Robert Rodriguez, and Matt Washington, Chairman of Community Board 11. I'd like to uh, ask Senator Kruger to come up. Senator Liz Kruger was first elected to the New York State Senate in 2002 
and currently is the ranking member of the powerful Senate Finance Committee. Liz's district has more hospitals than nearly any other Senate uh, district in the Senate, and she has been a proponent of affordable housing, health care, and Medicaid, and we are proud to call her our friend and our senator. Welcome. Good morning. Yes, I like to call my district Bedpan Alley. Um, it actually, hospitals and healthcare are the largest industry in my district, and actually there's something wonderful about the niche, um, sheer volume of great scientists and doctors and institutions. But I did want to make sure I recognized how important it was that Mount Sinai was there during Storm Sandy when NYU and Bellevue and the VA, all three hospitals also in my district, found themselves closed and evacuated. And you hear at Mount Sinai um, step to the plate and beyond and took on patients and took on doctors and staff from the other institutions as well. And frankly, I'm not sure what the city of New York would have done if not for institutions like this being able to so rapidly absorb um, the number of patients in need and the services that needed to continue. So to the entire family of Mount Sinai, I want to say thank you very much. Um, I also want to recognize um, Dr. Ken Davis and your chair, Peter May, who have done, as was implied, a phenomenal job of turning this institution around in a very short period of time when there were, I believe, as you said, darker days facing this institution, and that not only was it able to pull itself out of these darker days, um, but clearly redefine itself and its future as we are seeing today with the opening of this amazing group of medical facilities sharing um, in one new home. Obviously, I thank the board, the donors, the Hess family for the commitment to New York City and health care. And just in closing, what I also particularly appreciate about Mount Sinai, you never forget that you're a community hospital and that you are serving the community which in you, within which you are and that you do stellar programs um, both in the highest tech research fields in medicine, but also figuring out what are the core health care needs of your neighborhoods, East Harlem and Harlem, and serving with distinction, providing health care to the wealthiest New Yorkers and the poorest New Yorkers. And I thank you very much for the work you do every day. Thank you for allowing me to be here. Thank you, Senator Kruger. Our next uh, guest, Assembly Member Dick Gottfried, represents the 75th Assembly District, including the Mount Sinai Downtown HIV Clinic. He has served as Chairman of the Assembly Health Committee since 1987. He has been part of nearly every major health policy in the last 25 years, including the passage of managed care reforms, their creation of the Child Health Plus program, and Family Health Plus and the enactment of the Family Health Care Decision Act. It is an honor to have Assembly Gottfried with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here on such an occasion. Um, to, just to go a little off topic and, and talk about the new logo. As I was walking here, I, I saw it on several buildings, and I didn't realize that it was the first time I'd ever seen it until I got here and saw the little brochure about it. I think it's a real terrific achievement of graphic design that you can have a brand new logo that the first time you see it, you feel like it's an old friend. And, um, you know, what do I know about graphic design? But um, I, I, I think it was worth whatever you paid for it. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and, and I'm sure it wasn't done by a couple of interns on their lunchtime. Um, you know, this building really does symbolize what Mount Sinai 
is, is most known for, uh, for medical education and the most advanced treatment and all of the things we associate uh, with an academic medical center. And Mount Sinai certainly epitomizes uh, all of, of, of those values, as does this building. But uh, as Liz uh, Kruger said, I, to me, it's always important to remember uh, so many of the things th that Mount Sinai uh, also does. And I'm going to mention a couple of them, and I'm sure I will leave some out, and I apologize. But, you know, the Adolescent Health Center uh, is an amazing uh, institution uh, that you that you house. Uh, the Occupational and Environmental Medicine Program uh, provides extraordinary service and, uh, and, and leadership. Uh, the, the new Family Medicine Program, uh, I think, shows real leadership uh, in healthcare. And the fact that uh, your accountable care organization is one of the first uh, in New York and something which I hope we will uh, in future years uh, look back on and say uh, this really was a, 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 a good new road to be taking in, uh, in organizing health care. Um, and since we're quoting uh, uh, Kennedy's, uh, John Kennedy said uh, a few days before his inauguration, uh, of those to whom much is given, uh, much is required. And certainly those who have helped to uh, uh, finance this building uh, are, are, are serving in that tradition. Uh, President Kennedy's brother Robert said that the future uh, is not a gift, it is an achievement. And uh, all of your gifts are certainly uh, helping to make a lot of those achievements uh, possible. So thank you all and congratulations to everybody here. trying to come up with a Springsteen line, but I haven't <laughs> thought of one yet. Thank you, Assemblyman Gottfried. It is now my pleasure to introduce Assemblymember Robert Rodriguez, who was elected to the New York State Assembly in November 2010. We are fortunate that he represents Mount Sinai in the Assembly, as he has been involved in the Hess Center and Residential Tower Project from day one, when he served as the chair of Community Board 11. We are proud that this project brings affordable housing to East Harlem and that it will generate new jobs and that it will improve the health of local residents. It is my pleasure to introduce Assemblyman Rodriguez. Good morning, everyone. And I just wanted to give special thanks to uh, Chairman May and, and Dr. Davis for the, the tremendous vision in terms of bringing forward the, uh, this building for the long amount of time that it took to really gestate it and finally you know, bring it uh, to fruition. I think two comments that were made in each of their speeches, one was watershed, the other one was game changer. I absolutely believe that the future of uh, Mount Sinai and this institution is in, intertwined with the future of East Harlem. And I think as we move forward, as we look at the innovation, the research, and the technology that comes out of this, we see an opportunity in East Harlem to be uh, an extension of Liz Kruger's district on the Upper East Side over the next 10 and 20 years in terms of creating new institutions, new businesses in East Harlem that, uh, that can compete and I would say uh, surpass some of the work in other academic medical institutions and, and, and challenge those things that are happening on the West Coast or maybe up in Boston. So I, I, I look at the future of East Harlem, the job opportunities that come as a result of this, but also the transformational change that can happen throughout this community as a result of what is the backbone here, Mount Sinai. When we talk about assets that we have in medicine and in research in East Harlem. Uh, I think we have first-rate institutions bar none. The Hunter School for Social Work and Public Health, the Academy of Medicine, uh, uh, and, and certainly all of that wouldn't happen. The synergies that we expect, uh, the great things that can come out of that wouldn't happen if it weren't for the anchor of, of what I believe is our future in East Harlem in, in terms of uh, medical and academic research, which is Mount Sinai. So if it wasn't for the trustees and certainly for Dr. Davis for his vision, we wouldn't be able to, to cast a greater vision uh, for East Harlem and for the community. And I think my, my colleague, Senator Kruger, um, mentioned that 
Mount Sinai has not forgotten uh, about where they are and the communities that they serve. And they have done a tremendous job in terms of serving all communities, uh, both the East Harlem residents, but those uh, who are, and, and staying in the forefront of uh, providing quality care. They've never forgotten the people they serve. And this just gives us an opportunity to raise the bar higher. And, and hopefully the work that comes from, uh, uh, from the wonderful doctors that are here chairing different departments and uh, running different floors in the building will provide innovative solutions that can help provide better care for people across the country and across the world. So we look forward to that. Thank you all for your commitment and certainly to the trustees for making this happen. And uh, again, thank you for your longstanding contributions to East Harlem. Thank you. And I would also like to thank Community Board Chairman Matt Washington for joining us today. Matt is serving, uh, currently serving his second term as Chairman of Community Board 11. In this role, he has been a proponent of affordable housing, improving public schools, and bringing new jobs to East Harlem. He's a major, strong friend of Mount Sinai, and we welcome here today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for the uh, warm introduction, certainly to uh, Chairman May and Dr. Davis for all of your leadership. Uh, what wasn't said is, this is my home, uh, and like Assemblyman Rodriguez, we're both children of East Harlem. Uh, and as a child of East Harlem, Mount Sinai has such an importance to my being. As a 13-year-old kid in high school, I had a chance to come into the Science Center here and see an electron microscope. Uh, and how cool was that? And I got to tell all my friends about the electron microscope. Of course, I didn't know how to use it, but I was still the smartest kid on the block, if you asked anybody. And what I appreciate about Mount Sinai, and I think everyone in this room would agree with me, with the opening of this facility, uh, we will continue to be at leading the effort of medical and science research with the greatest minds on the planet. And of course, I'm biased, but uh, we will have the greatest, and we do have the greatest minds on the planet here at Mount Sinai, right in East Harlem, right in this community, right in my home, uh, right in the home of so many. And the opportunity to make lives better, to expose the young people across the street who are growing up to be the future greatest minds of the planet is such an incredible opportunity. I'm so thrilled about this new center being here to develop great research, to encourage young people to reach for the stars, to reach for the mountaintop, as the new logo encourages us to reach for. And it's just such an honor for me to be here to have been that 13-year-old child who came to see the electron microscope to now be standing here today to welcome in the next stage of medical and science research and to continue to encourage the young people of this community and the young people of this world to reach to the mountaintop. I'm so thrilled that Mount Sinai has been a part of my life, my entire life, and my family's life for the past 65 years. And I want to thank the Hess family for continuing to invest in Mount Sinai, it is a very special place. And so many people have been here uh, for all sorts of things, uh, bringing new lives into this world, uh, healing lives that have been uh, damaged, and working to really be a community facility, uh, but also to be the smartest and the best darn community facility and the best darn research facility that we could ever ask for. Uh, so thank you all for your leadership. Thank you all for your commitment uh, to making the best and to doing the best in my home. And I appreciate everything that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you for those inspiring remarks. Um, and now we're going to take a, a minute break or so, and we're going to do the ribbon cutting. Yeah. So hold on. We're all going to come up and do a ribbon cutting over there.
We're going to show a, a very short uh, countdown video, and then we're going to we're going to have a panel discussion among some of our uh, scientific leaders. And uh, for those of you who might have questions about what we're going to do in the building, uh, start thinking of them, you know, right now because we're going to have a, a Q and A period. So we're, we're all set with the video. I even think the Annenberg building is looking better. <laughs> Somehow. So I'd like to introduce uh, the, the leaders who are sitting uh, before you, and then we're going to have a brief panel discussion and then uh, be able to take any questions if you have some. First, I'd like to, going from right over here, over, uh, Stephen Boakoff, who's the director of the Tisch Cancer Institute. Stephen has been with us for now a couple of years, and he has transformed our cancer footprint at Mount Sinai. I think we've been recruiting about, uh, you know, a new physician or scientist literally every other uh, week. It is, as I mentioned in my remarks, it has taken us from being a, a, a good place in, in terms of cancer care and clinical research to a truly uh, great facility for getting state-of-the-art care and discovering uh, new treatments. Next is Eric Nessler, who's the director of the Friedman Brain Institute. Uh, Eric is a world-class uh, neuroscientist, similarly has been recruiting outstanding brain scientists and uh, clinicians in the departments of neurology and uh, psychiatry along with our chairs, also building our other departments like neurosurgery. And as I think Eric will mention, you know, his mission is to discover new treatments for these very serious diseases, uh, brain diseases that desperately need uh, new treatment. Next uh, is Valentin Fuster, who needs uh, no introduction. Uh, I think he's widely acknowledged as the best cardiologist in the world, um, an outstanding researcher, a mentor, uh, takes care of everybody. I don't know how he does it. He only needs four hours of sleep a night. <laughs> he's been an inspiring person for myself personally. He has built Mount Sinai Heart to be among the very best in the world, and similarly, we are uh, in recruitment mode to fill uh, the new research space in this building and also to expand uh, the clinical care we give to patients with heart diseases. Next is Eric Schatt, who's the director of the ICON Institute for Genomics and Multiscale Biology. Eric is one of the world's leaders in a revolution, and that is a revolution in genomics, and I don't know how, where the term came up with, but it's now the term, and that is big data, big data analysis. We uh, need to collect enormous amounts of data when we uh, sequence the human genome, Eric has recruited an army of people, bioinformaticists, that can analyze this data, collaborate uh, with our physicians and other scientists to make sense of it, and ultimately, most importantly, is to bring that to the bedside so that once we understand the genome at the, pa at the patient level, the individual patient level, it will change uh, care. Next is Bruce Gelb, who is a, a cardiologist a pediatric cardiologist, a go-to clinician, and also a spectacular a researcher who is a, uh, both sees patients and works in the lab and has made fundamental discoveries 
in understanding a variety of childhood onset cardiovascular disease. He uh, is the director of the Mindage Child Health and Development Institute, whose mission I alluded to before, and that is, is literally to change the life of our children across some of the most serious diseases that, that start in childhood, whether it's cardiolog cardiologic diseases, autism, uh, respiratory diseases, really it's across the gamut uh, of diseases that afflict our children. And next um, is Zahi Fayed. He is the director of our translational molecular imaging facility, which uh, traditionally, and uh, is so in this building, is in the basement. Uh, <laughs> with his leadership and also with Bert Dreyer, the uh, chairman of radiology, we have, uh, are installing some of the most up-to-date imaging equipment that you can buy. Uh, that's high field magnets. To the, for those of you who have had MRIs, you typically get it uh, with an MRI machine that is either a 1.5 Tesla or a 3 Tesla. Uh, we are installing a 70 Tesla, which gives us in multiples, not just double, but in multiples, uh, more precision to be able to peer into the human body, including uh, the human brain. Uh, Zahi is also an expert in nanotechnology, and that is a a new area of research that ultimately we see ourselves being able to deliver medicines at small amounts to just where they need to go in the body so that you're not taking a pill <coughs> that gets to the place it needs to go to but goes to other places where you don't need that medicine to be and can cause uh, uh, side effects. So these are just some of the leaders, you know, that will lead the charge in, in this new building. There are many others, you know, in this room. Uh, that are equally important to, you know, reaching our goals that I've talked about. At this point, I'd like to ask each of them to take a minute and uh, essentially speculate about the moonshot. You know, that what, you know, what can we do now, but, you know, what's in your dreams about what we can do in this building over the next five or ten years or even uh, beyond? And we'll start with cancer. Okay. <clears throat> First of all, I, w I really do want to thank Peter... Ken and Dennis. It was meeting them five years ago, being inspired both by their enthusiasm and their vision that convinced me that Mount Sinai was the place of the future. And to follow up on what uh, Dennis just said, we probably have recruited to date well over 40 faculty with a focus on cancer, whether it's in the laboratory or clinically. So let me make a few comments again. First of all, what this building means. You know, we talk, and you'll hear a lot about the term translational research. And of course, we define that as data that's uh, discovered in the laboratory, brought to patients, and vice versa. Well, the reality is that is really difficult to do. We all know that, in fact, our physicians that are, first of all, responsible for patients uh, don't have the luxury of the time and the control over the, their time. They have to respond to patients and cancer patients get sick, uh, and when they get sick, uh, those physicians have to be there. Scientists now are in the laboratory, obviously coping with a very difficult funding situation given what's happening at the NIH, and also learning all these new languages. There's immunology, we'll hear about genomics, there's cancer biology, et cetera. Uh, they have a, a different set of responsibilities. And the real question is, how do you get them all together? Because it really is creating that interface that can occur spontaneously that is going to result in these great discoveries. And I think that's what we have here. We have two floors where our patients uh, come, our cancer patients, where our physicians practice, and two floors above them. And those two floors, these floors are enormous. It can hold almost 200 people who will be at the bench doing discovery work in cancer. And by being in such close proximity, it really creates the possibility when people have little time and have other responsibilities to be able to get together uh, and uh, have creative solutions. So I think it's really, in many ways, the way this building has been thought out uh, the, that will be transformative. And I think, as Dennis said, I think what we're finding now, and we are certainly part of it, given some of the terrific scientists and uh, clinical investigators, cancer's moving uh, and moving very rapidly, in part uh, depending upon genomics. But really what we're finding is we have many diseases. A great example is multiple myeloma, where patients five years ago had a life expectancy of two years, and it's now over 10 years. 
We have targeted therapies. We have immunotherapies. We have extraordinary opportunities, but we need to get our physicians and clinical investigators and scientists together side by side, and this is exactly what this building allows to happen. So I think we're extraordinarily fortunate, and I'm obviously very pleased I decide to come. Thank you. Eric? Well, this is an exciting day for Mount Sinai and for the Friedman Brain Institute. Five out of the top ten causes of disease burden worldwide are brain diseases. Uh, these include depression, dementia, psychosis, stroke, and addiction. Nothing will have a more positive, greater impact on humanity than tackling these illnesses. Mount Sinai has a long and distinguished track record of excellence in brain science, and the opening of the Hess Center will make us even better. The Hess Center will make it possible for us to recruit over 10 new faculty to Mount Sinai, and we've already attracted several national and international leaders, as well as some of the most promising young scientists to our faculty. The design of the Hess Center is also a major advantage in that it brings together uh, experts across several disciplines, as you'll hear. I'll just give one example. Uh, our new Brain Imaging Center, which will be located here in the Hess Center, is made possible uh, by the state-of-the-art imaging instruments that Dennis mentioned uh, that will be located in the basement of, CS uh, of, uh, of the Hess Center and by, also made possible by the world-class imaging expertise of uh, Dr. Fayyad and his colleagues. And this is illustrated by a new brain scan uh, that makes it possible for the first time to diagnose patients with Alzheimer's disease. This scan detects an abnormal protein called beta amyloid that accumulates in the brains of patients with this illness, and Mount Sinai was the first institution in New York City to offer the new test. So this is just one example of many uh, in which we uh, believe that the Hess Center will transform brain research at Mount Sinai, and we look forward very much to the many exciting discoveries that we can expect over the next decade. Thanks. <clears throat> well, uh, I will say this is an amazing uh, building uh, because it really pulls all together horizontally those who are in the cardiovascular field. But what is exciting is vertically, we really, we are all integrated. And I think this is absolutely unique in this regard. Uh, about the cardiovascular field, the bad news is still the number one killer today. Cardiovascular diseases, and uh, I see three different trends evolving uh, over the next decade. The first one is to know who is developing the disease and doesn't know yet. And this will be through imaging technology that is being developed in part here. And then the question is, once you know you're developing the disease, are you going to change behavior? So is this a very complex issue that is a tremendous task that have, we have in front of us? In the other extreme, we see people who already had the heart attacks and the, 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 the left ventricle is not working well. I have to say that um, stem cell therapy here we have a fantastic group of people, and we are actually recruiting uh, two or three others, senior people, are absolutely internationally recognized. And then how you enhance these cells that you give through gene therapy. And, and the first work was done here by Roger Hajar, who is actually the head of the cardiovascular research center here. So uh, how we recover a heart that is already damaged is the other extreme. But then what is most exciting is the integration of the heart and the brain. And this is not on an emotional basis. I palpitate, so I'm emotional. This is real, and that is what we are finding through imaging technology, in part developed by Zahi Fayyad, actually, is that the same risk factors that affect the circulation of the heart affect the microcirculation of the brain, the white matter. So what happens is degenerative brain disease and even Alzheimer's may be accelerated by the same risk factors that affect the main arteries. And these are the tiny arteries that we are now able to see with imaging. I just finished to say, I have been in this institution for many years, probably more than many of the people sitting here. This is amazing. I think this is a dream. I could never, ever have predicted that we will be sitting here today. And I have to 
say that the executive group that are sitting here today have made this possible. Thank you. Eric. <laughs> so it's a great pleasure as well for, for me to be here with uh, very esteemed colleagues who are really on a path to resolve some of the most uh, horrific diseases that plague uh, our society and, uh, and those around the planet. Uh, what we're aiming to do here at the Hess Center is to leverage all of this amazing expertise, all of the amazing technologies, whether it's imaging or whole genome sequencing or looking at the proteome or the metabolome or looking at all the bugs that are crawling around on your system that you can't see. Uh, but uh, we're learning every day how that drives uh, uh, not only your risk of disease, but even uh, some behaviors. So how do we take those vast mountains of data, you, you know, uh, as, as big as exists in all of the digital universe, and how do we combine and integrate that information and build predictive models that not only predict your risk of disease, uh, but, but elucidate how you can intervene and prevent somebody from going into a, a disease state. And if I had to say where we hope to be 10 years from now, it's uh, you can sort of imagine a topographical map uh, of your life course, your health course. And, and on that map are all the high energy states uh, that are representing different disease states or normal states. And as you're living your life and we're able to sample at very high resolution everything that's going on, not only inside of you, but in your environment, that we can project what state you're, you're in. Are you uh, in a disease state or a normal state? And what's your trajectory? Are you on a trajectory that's going to push you into a disease state? And if so, how can we intervene and provide the right kind of uh, either therapy or lifestyle change recommendation that's going to keep you going on to the, to the healthy state? And this isn't science fiction. This is, this is stuff that with this type of team here, the big supercomputers we're building that are uh, you know, going to get us to the kind of Google scale, Amazon scale computing that we need to build the models and then the application and the setting uh, I think is going to change everything. So I'm excited to see 10 years from now what we're all doing. He's not joking. We are building it. We have built a big computer. <laughs> <laughs> so good morning. Uh, this is enormously uh, exciting moment for Mount Sinai and for the Mindage Child Health and Development Institute. And uh, we heard from our guests earlier about the role of Mount Sinai in East Harlem. And we are focusing on problems of children's health, problems like asthma, neurodevelopmental problems, obesity, that take a high toll throughout the world, and certainly in New York, but take a particularly high toll um, with our neighbors, uh, the children in East Harlem. And that's something we've got to change. As exciting as the times are scientifically, from a pediatric point of view, it's sad, because we know that children being born today actually have a life expectancy that's less than their parents. That's the first time that's happened in our country, and we need to redirect that. And discovery, fundamental discovery, like in, uh, that is going to occur in the Hess Center, um, can redirect that, that fate. Um, and there are problems that we never thought were treatable, things like uh, developmental disabilities that we're now coming to understand are, and uh, one of the first trials for autism, for therapy for autism, is just about to be undertaken at Mount Sinai through the Seaver Center. Which, with which uh, CHDI interacts. And these are the exciting things that we can do here. And in, in terms of the meaning of this building, um, since the leitmotif this morning seems to be historical reference, I'd like to invoke one a little more recent from about 200 years ago. Dean Charney will recognize it immediately. That amazing moment uh, when uh, the band of uh, discoverers, known as the Corps of Discovery, first dipped their paddles into the Missouri River and were off to make remarkable discoveries. They knew they were off to do big things. They didn't know exactly how they were going to get there. And they surely knew that they were only going to get there if they relied on one another. And that's how it is for us scientifically. I think all of us would say we're off to do big things and that we need one another. We need the groups. We need a lot more boats than just could be filled with those here. But we're working together. And I think um, the ability to be near some amazing scientists doing things like uh, neurobiology, Cardio fundamental cardiovascular research and so on will enable the things that we're hoping to do for children's health. That's the Lewis and Clark expedition. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Thank they you. were called the core of discovery. They, yeah. Thank you. Good morning. Also, this is um, really exciting for us. It seems like we are all have different tools, but we speak the same language. Uh, we know that a first step for a good therapeutic is a good diagnostic. Uh, it, we have the proof today, clinically, 
uh, that imaging influence every step uh, of research and clinical care. We've heard earlier and we've seen images uh, of brain imaging now that we can s figure out the connection between the brain with high resolution imaging and trying to figure out what's normal, what's abnormal. Uh, cardiovascular imaging is now better diagnosed uh, with coronary CT, for example, in an emergency room. We can make better decision, try to figure out which patient needs to get which intervention. Uh, cancer detection uh, with imaging uh, is, have really improved survival rates, uh, examples in lung uh, and, and cancer and, and breast cancer detection. And finally, we've heard a little bit about the aspect of nanomedicine, which it really it's precise. Uh, and, and a diagnosis uh, potential and targeted drug delivery, which is going to help us a lot uh, minimize uh, the side effect of some of these drugs and also improve uh, their, their potential in terms of, in terms of the treatment. Uh, so for us, it's also a, a dream come true. Uh, this is really now where we bring the whole team together under one single roof, uh, very different from what other places have done. We have a comprehensive multidisciplinary uh, team. We have unbelievably um, um, state-of-the-art uh, wet labs for our nanomedicine on the seventh floor. Uh, we have a very powerful um, uh, tools that are connected to the, uh, to the Minerva computer to do better data uh, and image analysis and visualization. And we are in the basement. We like it in the basement. It's actually uh, uh, it's a lot of great discoveries uh, have been made. It's actually Einstein, when he was working uh, in the patent office in Switzerland, he was doing it down from the basement. Uh, so we're extremely happy uh, to be there. Um, I'm going to remind we, you of that. Yeah. We have um, uh, seven. We we have actually very powerful uh, new equipment coming in. We have set up a very strong collaboration with Siemens Medical. We're very excited about installing one of the first seven Tesla whole body uh, uh, actively shielded scanners. It's going to give us precise uh, imaging at the microscopic level in vivo in human. We, are, we, have such, we have had such a great experience marrying the MRI and the positron emission tomography. We had the first installation in the world in 2009, a project done with the help also of Dr. Valentin Fuster. Now we're going to take the equipment and put them all in one single machine rather than two machines in the same room. We're bring, going to bring molecular imaging uh, uh, to, to that level. And then finally, I think we're going to try to disrupt a little bit uh, uh, the way how CT, computer tomography, is going to be done with the first ever novel detectors using silicon uh, photon counting technology, where now we're going to bring CT to the to lowest possible radiation level with precise imaging. So we're extremely, extremely excited to be here. Well, thank you, each of you, for an inspiring message. Are there any questions from the audience that uh, that we can illuminate? Yep, Andy. Thank you, Andy, and thank you for your leadership nice. as a member of the Board of Trustees. Thank you. I, I, yeah, Ross, Ross Kagan, who's Associate Dean in our graduate school and is conducting some terrific scientist, science uh, aimed at discovering new treatments for serious cancer. Thanks. Uh, my question is, what I think is really interesting, no, whatever. What I think is really interesting about this building is getting you guys with tools together with those of you who are focused on particular diseases. So my question is, you have big data sitting, I forget what floor you're on, uh, sitting above you or below you. <laughs> um, how are you going to make use of it? I mean, it's an amazing opportunity, yeah? I'll say a little bit, but one, you know, um, and then Eric can, you know, uh, either Eric can you know, jump in. One of the things that I think Eric Shatt and his team, you know, has done since they've been here is connect. Um, I, I talk to our cancer researchers, our brain researchers, cardiac, and so forth, and they, they all have established collaborations with our genomics group, uh, and including those who are doing very large data analysis to you know, uncover things that would not have been possible without that collaboration. Yeah, yeah and I think the real brilliance of this move is, is having the sort of information-driven component sitting within the nerve center of all of these uh, clinical 
uh, disciplines that are actually out on the front line trying to find cures and better treatments and better diagnosis for disease. So the big data, uh, and we're doing some great stuff with Ross, very progressive on you know being able to sequence your entire genome and, and over populations, and each genome's a terabyte of data, right? That's about 100 iPhones. Uh, so consider that over 1,000 people. Now you have a million iPhones worth of information. It's a lot of data. But if we integrate that in the right way and we have a particular cancer patient that, that uh, is in a terminal case, they don't really understand the mechanisms involved, we can sequence that person in a, in a matter of days. We can interpret that genome. We can project it onto all the networks that define different treatments and help inform what kind of new therapies might be applicable to that case. And of course, this is all in the research arena, but as we get these proofs of concepts going, which we can do because we're all sort of sharing uh, this, this one building and can, can communicate and integrate with each other to do that, then it will absolutely transform the way we interpret disease in a, in a clinical setting. And I'd like to add a new dimension to that for the nervous system where the brain not only has the molecular big data context, but also a whole separate dimension of 100 billion nerve cells and 100 trillion connections among those nerve cells defining every aspect of brain function. That's work by, led by John Morrison here and many others for a number of years. And that what we need to do in brain is to overlay both of those big data, really bigger data in some ways, in terms of understanding how the brain works under normal conditions and what goes wrong with disease. In fact, in moving out here, uh, as I'm driving across the country with my five kids and wife, I'm already working with Eric Nessler and Pamela Scalar. Uh, writing a grant uh, in seven days as I drove across the country to exactly integrate the imaging data with the molecular data to do exactly what he's saying. We actually got funded, so it was, uh, it was a, fun, a fun trip. So, so, so just following up uh, on Ross's question and what uh, Eric Schott was just saying, so when we look in the genome of a cancer, we'll find thousands of mutations. So what you have to then do is look at a 1,000 patients and therefore look at what are the commonalities in terms of mutation. And Ross knows this. In fact, what he's done uh, has been used the fruit fly. So to be able to simplify a little bit their signaling uh, system to be able to focus on some of these mutations. But we need to then, when you focus on a mutation, and you're convinced that is what you have to target it, that's when we can target these mutations with new drugs, new treatments, and we've now seen this over and over again in various cancers, especially lung cancer. If you can come up with the right target, build a drug to stop that mutation from functioning, you can get uh, remissions remarkably well. Any other questions? Terry. That's Terry Wiley, who heads up our Office of Technology and Business Development, which these guys have to interact with, so we're going to make those <laughs> discoveries. Mm -hmm. I can, okay. to me, one of the most exciting uh, aspects, and we are now in the frontiers of having an impact, is, uh, is gene therapy um, at the level of the heart that is failing. And this is a, a repeated technology developed here by Roger Hajar, who is the first in the world who has been using such uh, technology of gene therapy. And basically, uh, some hearts fail but because they are hibernating, they are at sleep. And what you do is you inject a gene that actually gives the molecules that wake up the heart. And that's basically the principle. So when a heart is not working, in part it's because it's a scar. This is after heart attack. But in part it's because some muscle is at sleep. And with gene therapy, you can really recover such hearts. This, to me, is an amazing advance which took place during the last year and actually was pioneered here. You know, I think, I think we can go on and on. Um, no, no, good. <laughs> but we're not. <laughs> <laughs> this building just doesn't get built, right? For those of you, you know, uh, who've been here over the last five years, it started with a big hole. 
and then it took four plus years to build. And we had a great group of people running the show and building this building. And I want to acknowledge some of them, Ben Safari, David Farron, in the back. I don't know if Ned Berger's here. Rama Iangard, Jim Larkin, just, you know, there was a, a whole team that have really done this, and let's give them a round of applause. 